imagine your home alone on a dark and stormy night, binge watching your latest favorite TV series. There's a knock at the door. When you answer, you find two trench coat clad FBI agents on your doorstep, and they want to ask you a few questions. So unknown to you, the FBI has been investigating a large fraud conspiracy, and they have a confidential informant named Pat, who is supposedly involved in this conspiracy. Now, Pat's been feeding them lots of information about the other co-conspirators and the details of their plans. But the FBI has begun to suspect that Pat's not being truthful with them. Most recently, Pat gave them information about a meeting of the co-conspirators last Tuesday that Pat supposedly attended. But the agents had been following Pat, and they know that in fact, last Tuesday, Pat arrived at your house about 6 p.m. and didn't leave until the following morning. They also know that you were home on Tuesday night, and they've also seen you and Pat together on other occasions. So they know Pat has lied to them about last Tuesday, and now they want to ask you about that. Well, it turns out that you and Pat are having a torrid affair. You don't want anyone to know, and you certainly don't think it's any of the FBI's business. So when they ask you about Pat and last Tuesday, you lie to them. Nope, I don't know Pat. Pat hasn't ever been here. Don't know what you're talking about. Goodbye. Well, many people might be surprised to learn that in that scenario, you likely have committed a felony that could land you in jail for up to 10 years. Now, some Americans may believe that they have an almost inalienable right to lie to the government in order to keep it out of their business. But that scene does, in fact, describe a potential violation of the statute that's our focus for this lecture. False statements. Title 18, United States Code, Section 1001. Or, more simply, lying to the government. The breadth of the false statements statute is quite remarkable. In our hypothetical scene, notice what was missing. The agents didn't place you under oath. They didn't give you any Miranda-like warnings about how you had a right to remain silent or how lying to them would be a crime. They didn't tell you you could get a lawyer. They didn't record the statement to ensure its accuracy or have you write it down and sign it so there'd be a clear record of what you said. And perhaps most significantly, you didn't cause the government any harm. They already knew the truth, and they knew you were lying as soon as you denied knowing Pat. You didn't hamper their investigation in any way or send them off on a wild goose chase. Well, legally, none of that matters. You've still violated the statute. Now, factually, of course, details like that may matter a great deal when it comes to the exercise of prosecutorial discretion, as we've discussed, and the decision about what cases you would actually bring as a prosecutor. The crime of false statements applies in two different kinds of situations. The first is as what we've called a cover-up crime, a crime committed to conceal some other misconduct. So a defendant who has engaged in some other criminal activity may lie about it when interviewed by the FBI, or may falsify some government report in order to conceal that misconduct. So making false statements is one of the leading cover-up crimes, along with perjury and obstruction of justice. In another type of false statements prosecution, the charge operates more like a fraud statute. Now, for example, a defendant may falsify information on an application for a government grant or a contract in order to wrongfully obtain government money, or may submit fraudulent billing invoices or required reports to the government. When signing government forms, you've probably seen the warnings that intentionally providing false information on the form is a federal crime. Well, that's the crime of false statements, 18 U.S.C. 1001. In cases involving fraud against the government, in addition to charges like mail and wire fraud, false statements is a very common charge. And the false statements in such a case are made not to cover up other past wrongdoing, but as part of the underlying misconduct itself. In our previous lecture, we talked about another cover-up crime, perjury. And you'll recall that an important element of perjury was that the testimony was given or document provided while the witness was under oath. A false statements is far broader because it applies to any material statement, oral or written, made to the federal government with no requirement that the statement be under oath. False statements may be in writing, but they don't have to be. One relatively common use of the statute is to charge witnesses with lying to the FBI during unsworn interviews, as in that hypothetical I used at the start of this lecture. In the investigation by special counsel Robert Mueller, into Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. election, for example, 
Individuals including former Trump National Security Advisor Michael Flynn and former Trump campaign advisor George Papadopoulos pleaded guilty to false statements for lying during unsworn interviews with the FBI. Both men admitted that they lied about their contacts with various Russians in the days leading up to the election and inauguration. Now, false statements charges are extremely common in white collar cases. And one reason is the statute's breadth. It applies to almost any situation in which a defendant has deceived the government in some way. Another reason is simplicity. It's a very straightforward charge, easy to explain to a jury. Everyone knows what lying is and everyone knows that it's wrong. Although not everyone might think it should be a federal crime. A charge of false statements also can play an important role in helping prosecutors prove criminal intent or guilty knowledge. And as we've discussed, proof of intent is the key to many white collar cases. And if the defendant lied about his conduct, that can be important circumstantial evidence of bad intent. Ladies and gentlemen, when asked about this by the FBI, why did he lie? Because he knew that what he'd done was wrong. So in addition to being a standalone charge, therefore, false statements can also help the government prove the intent necessary to prove other crimes, such as fraud. To convict under Section 1001, the government must prove the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant made a false, fictitious, or fraudulent statement, used the false document or writing, or concealed facts through a trick, scheme, or device. The false statements or concealed facts were material. The statement or concealment took place in a matter within the jurisdiction of one of the three branches of the federal government. And the defendant acted knowingly and willfully. So the first requirement is that the statement be false. Now that may seem a bit obvious, but as with the related crime of perjury, the requirement of actual falsity is important. It means there is no room for ambiguity or uncertainty. If a question or answer is open to different interpretations, a statement that initially appears false may not be. And the government has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that the statement made or document or record used was actually false. And as with perjury, the question of actual falsity often is tied up with the question of intent. If a question is ambiguous or contains terms that are open to more than one interpretation, what may appear to be a false answer may really reflect an honest misunderstanding or misinterpretation. So even if the statement appears false, in other words, that was not the intent of the person making the statement, and it won't be a crime. There are three different subsections or prongs of section 1001 and three different ways to violate it. Prongs two and three prohibit false, fictitious, or fraudulent statements, or using writings or documents that contain such statements. But the first prong of the statute is slightly different. It prohibits concealing material facts through a trick, scheme, or device, even in the absence of outright lies. Because there's no general duty to speak to the government, the concealing material facts theory may only be used when the defendant is under a duty to disclose the facts in question. For example, suppose I live near a large factory that's run by a friend of mine. And one day I notice there's a large pipe coming out of the back of the factory that's dumping green sludge into the river. So I ask my friend about it and he says, yeah, you know, disposing of that stuff properly is so expensive, we decided to just dump it in the river. Let's hope the government never finds out. So I go on with my day and I don't say anything. But next week, I see a bunch of FBI and EPA vans in front of the factory, agents hauling out boxes of documents, and my friend being led away in handcuffs. A couple of agents walk over to my house because they want to interview me to see what I know about the factory. But I don't want to get my friend in trouble. So when they knock on the door, I pretend I'm not home and I don't answer. The FBI later learns that I was home and I did have extremely relevant information about the factory and my friend's confession. So they go to the U.S. attorney and ask to have me charged with false statements, arguing that I concealed material facts from the FBI through the trick, scheme, or device of pretending not to be home. Now that theory of prosecution, fortunately, will not work. So I was under no obligation to speak to those agents. Even if I answered the door, I could have refused to talk to them and told them to get lost. So even though many would agree I was under a moral or ethical obligation to tell the agents what I knew, I can't be criminally prosecuted for concealing from the government information that I was under no legal obligation to disclose.
So to bring a case based on concealing material facts, the government needs to be able to point to a duty to disclose based on specific requirements to disclose specific information. And these may be found in applicable government regulations or statutes or from government forms or paperwork that require the disclosure of certain information when being completed. Now, for example, suppose I'm filling out a job application for a federal agency and a question asks whether I've ever been convicted of a felony. Let's say I have, but I figure if I admit that, I won't get the job. So rather than check yes or no, I just leave the answer blank and then sign the bottom of the form attesting that all of my answers are true. Well, I didn't make a literally false statement because I didn't answer the question at all. But I could be charged under 1001 for concealing material facts that I had an obligation to disclose through the trick, scheme, or device of leaving that question blank. The next element the government must prove under Section 1001 in order to convict is that the false statements or concealed facts are material. In other words, they must be about something that potentially mattered. And criminal law does not punish lies that are trivial or irrelevant. And we've seen this same materiality requirement in other statutes we've discussed, including perjury and mail and wire fraud. But materiality is defined very broadly. And the statement need only have the potential to affect the decision of the agency to which it is made. There's no requirement that the statement actually affected any outcome, that it was believed, or that the government relied on it in any way. In other words, materiality is judged based on the nature of the statement, not on any actual impact that it had. So recall my hypothetical at the beginning of this lecture, with the FBI agents showing up at your doorstep to ask you about Pat. When you lie about not knowing Pat, they know it right away, and you're not affecting their investigation at all. But that lie is still material, because the statement by its nature had the potential to influence their actions. It was relevant to their investigation, and had they known less information, it could definitely have influenced how they would act. And that's all that's required for materiality. The next element that the government must prove is that the false statement or concealment was in a matter within the jurisdiction of one of the three branches of the federal government. So this requirement serves to establish a basis for federal criminal jurisdiction. The lies must be in connection with the business of the federal government. Lying to your boss at a private company or your neighbor or even to a state agency is generally not going to fall within the false statement statute. And the statute likewise does not apply to lying to the press or to the American public, which is good news for a lot of politicians. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court explored the meaning of this within the jurisdiction requirement in the case of United States versus Rogers. In 1982, the defendant, Larry Rogers, called the Kansas City office of the FBI and reported that his wife had been kidnapped. So agents spent over 100 hours investigating, only to learn that Rogers' wife had actually left him voluntarily. Two weeks later, Rogers called the Secret Service and told them that his wife was involved in a plot to assassinate the president. And those agents spent more than 150 hours investigating and finally located Rogers' wife in Arizona. And she told them she left Kansas City to get away from her husband, which seems completely understandable. And Rogers later admitted that he made the false reports so that the FBI and Secret Service would help him locate his estranged wife. Now, Rogers was indicted on two counts of making false statements, one to the FBI and one to the Secret Service. He moved to dismiss, arguing that his false statements were not within the jurisdiction of the FBI and Secret Service, within the meaning of the statute. And the lower courts agreed with him, holding that the phrase, within the jurisdiction, should be interpreted to mean that the agency has the power to make binding or final determinations concerning the matter in question. And the FBI and Secret Service, the lower courts said, do not have that power. So the FBI and Secret Service don't have the power to decide cases, create binding regulations, or otherwise finally resolve any matters. They investigate, but final determinations concerning what actions to take are made by prosecutors or other agencies. So accordingly, the lower courts held, false statements made to those agencies are not within the jurisdiction of the federal government within the meaning of the statute, and Rogers' indictment should be dismissed. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court disagreed, 
and concluded that the lower court's interpretation of jurisdiction was, quote, unduly strained. So when interpreting the word jurisdiction, the court said, we should begin with the meaning of that word in ordinary, everyday language. And the most natural reading of the term is that it refers to all matters confided to the authority of an agency or department. So a department or agency therefore has jurisdiction when it has the power to exercise authority in a particular situation. Now, the FBI certainly has the power and authority to investigate kidnappings, just as the Secret Service has the power to investigate plots against the president. So false statements to those agencies concerning such matters, therefore, were in a matter within the jurisdiction of those agencies. Congress had the power to protect such agencies from the harmful consequences and disruptions that could occur as a result of a false report such as those made by Rogers. And it did so through the false statement statute. And the lower courts had justified their narrower interpretation primarily by citing a concern that fear of a criminal prosecution might deter witnesses from speaking to law enforcement and reporting suspected crimes. But the Supreme Court thought that justification was dubious. The requirement that the government prove a knowing and willful lie, the court said, means that those who are reporting information innocently and in good faith should have little to fear. They should not be deterred from coming forward by any fear of criminal prosecution for an innocent misstatement. But in any event, the court said, if there is a concern that the statute sweeps too broadly, that concern is properly addressed to Congress. And Congress could amend 1001 to exclude statements to investigative agencies if it thought that was a concern. But the court's job is to interpret the statute at, as it is currently written, which meant, in the court's view, that Rogers loses. So this last part of the court's decision is a common theme in white collar cases that we see over and over. For the most part, these cases involve the court interpreting statutes that Congress has written. And that means if Congress believes the court has gotten something wrong, it has the power to go in and fix it by amending the statute. So the court will often say, this is what we think the statute says and what we think Congress intended, but if we're wrong, or Congress wants the statute to mean something else, Congress has the power to correct it. Now, the court is not interpreting the U.S. Constitution, where it has more or less the last word, absent a constitutional amendment. And when it comes to statutes, the court only has to determine what it believes the current statute says, confident in the knowledge that Congress has the ability to change that statute if it thinks the court got it wrong. Now, sometimes Congress does respond to a court decision interpreting a criminal statute. In fact, it has done so with false statements. The version of the statute interpreted by the court in Rogers prohibited false statements in a matter within the jurisdiction of, quote, any department or agency of the United States. The courts had read that language to mean the statute applied to all three branches of the federal government. But concerns arose over the application of the statute in court proceedings. Now, we already had the laws against perjury to cover false testimony. And how did the false statements law apply to statements by advocates? For example, if a lawyer made a, a, a frivolous objection to try to keep out relevant evidence in a trial, could she later be accused of using a trick, scheme, or device to conceal material facts? But to avoid this dilemma, some lower courts created what they called the judicial function exception. A judge made a rule that said 1001 did not apply in court proceedings. Now that exception served its purpose, but it did not actually appear in the language of the statute. In a 1995 case called Hubbard v. United States, the court took up the issue of the judicial function exception. And it rejected the idea of creating an exception that did not appear in the statute. But it also said it was unnecessary. The language, department or agency of the United States, the court held, refers only to executive branch agencies. So therefore, the statute does not apply to false statements to Congress or to any part of the judicial branch of the government. There was no need for a judicial function exception, the court said, because the statute did not apply to court proceedings at all. When Hubbard was decided, I was part of the team working on the prosecution of former Illinois Congressman Dan Rostenkowski for allegedly looting money from a number of different House of Representatives expense programs. Well, five counts in our indictment of Rostenkowski were for false statements under Section 1001 for signing false payroll and expense vouchers submitted to the House of Representatives. After the Hubbard decision, he successfully moved to have those counts dismissed because the Supreme Court had ruled that 
false statements to Congress were not covered by 1001. Now, we had a number of other theories in our indictment, so the entire case didn't go away. But it's an interesting example of how a Supreme Court decision can affect your cases as a prosecutor. It also helps to explain why prosecutors often like to have alternative theories and charges in the same indictment for essentially the same conduct. Because you never know when a Hubbard decision might come along and throw a wrench in the gears of your case. In any event, Congress responded to Hubbard by amending the statute. So Section 1001 now explicitly applies to all three branches of the federal government. It also expressly provides for a version of the old judicial function exception by saying the crime does not apply to statements made by parties or their attorneys during court proceedings. And although it applies to witnesses who make statements in congressional proceedings and to members of Congress who falsify administrative paperwork or filings, it exempts statements made by constituents sending information to members of Congress. And Congress apparently did not want to stem the free flow of information from members of the public to their representatives, even if some of that information might turn out to be false. Rogers is also an interesting example of the exercise of prosecutorial discretion. Now, lying to the FBI is extremely common, and not all such cases can result in a criminal prosecution, or agents and prosecutors would have no time to do anything else. So why does a case like Rogers end up getting prosecuted? Well, several factors probably entered into the decision. First was the nature of his false reports, claims of kidnapping and a plot to assassinate the president. And the government definitely wants to deter the making of false reports about such serious topics, and prosecuting such a case can serve to deter others. And second was the fact that the agencies actually devoted substantial resources to investigating his false reports. Now, actual reliance by and damage to the government is not required, as we've discussed, but it could certainly be a factor in deciding whether a particular case was worthy of prosecution. And then there's the fact that Rogers affirmatively sought out the government agencies and made false reports to trick them into finding his wife for him. So this affirmative enlisting of the government for his private ends makes his case more serious than that of a witness who may lie when the FBI comes to him for an interview, but who did not affirmatively take the initiative to make a false report. As with so many white-collar crimes, the intent requirement of Section 1001 is where the rubber meets the road. It may be clear the defendant made a false statement, but the key is often proving the defendant's state of mind. So the knowing and willful requirement means the lies or concealment must be intentional and done with a bad purpose. And the statute does not apply to mistakes or inadvertent failures to disclose. It doesn't apply if a person was simply confused or misunderstood the question. It doesn't apply if he failed to disclose the relevant information because he forgot it. The government has the burden of proving that the defendant knew the statement was false and that he acted with a bad purpose, knowing that making the false statement was wrong. Finally, we should discuss a doctrine under the false statements statute called the exculpatory no. So think back again to the hypothetical that began this lecture, with the agents showing up at your door to ask you about Pat. Well, part of the reason we might be uncomfortable with the prosecution in that case stems from our general right in this country to be left alone by the government and to refuse to speak to the government if we don't want to or if we might incriminate ourselves. In criminal law, of course, this right is embodied in the Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. And these concerns about fairness and constitutional implications had led some lower courts to create an exception to the false statement statute that they called the exculpatory no. So under this doctrine, if a witness was being questioned by the government and simply denied his or her guilt, I didn't do it, well, that exculpatory denial could not be prosecuted as a false statement under Section 1001. The idea was that such a statement is basically the equivalent of pleading not guilty and should not subject the witness to a criminal charge. And once again, this was a judge-created exception that did not appear in the language of the statute. And once again... When it made its way to the Supreme Court in a 1998 case called Brogan v. United States, that exception did not fare very well. So James Brogan was questioned by federal agents investigating potential wrongdoing within a real estate company where he was a union officer. 
The agents asked him if he had received any cash gifts or payments from the company while he was an officer, and he said no. The agents then told him that they had found records reflecting that he had received such payments, and that lying to them was a crime. But he did not change his answer. And when he was later charged with false statements, he asked the Supreme Court to adopt the exculpatory no exception and to rule that he could not be prosecuted. In an opinion by Justice Antonin Scalia, the court rejected Brogan's argument. A simple denial of guilt, the court said, plainly falls within the language of the false statement statute. It's false, it's material, and it's made to a government agency. But Brogan argued that the situation he had faced placed him in what he called a cruel trilemma. He could either confess, lie, or refuse to talk and therefore look like he had something to hide. But the court was not impressed. The court said that one branch of this supposed trilemma, remaining silent, was actually the right provided by the Constitution to someone in Brogan's situation. He had the right to remain silent, to tell the investigators he did not want to talk. That was the appropriate solution to his supposed trilemma. And the court was not willing to consider the Constitution's solution as actually being part of the problem. As Justice Scalia concluded, whether or not the predicament of a wrongdoer run to ground tugs at the heartstrings, neither the text nor the spirit of the Fifth Amendment confers a privilege to lie. But Brogan's lies violated the plain language of the statute the court held, and his conviction was affirmed. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote a concurring opinion in Brogan, meaning she agreed with the outcome but had something to add. And although she agreed that Brogan's case fell within the statute and that there was no exculpatory no exception, she expressed concern about the power that this granted to agents and prosecutors to manufacture crimes. She noted that agents who had nothing else on a witness could conduct an informal interview, try to catch the witness in a lie, and then use that new false statements charge as leverage over the witness. Or if the statute of limitations had run out on a crime, Agents could go interview the defendant and try to get him to lie about it, thus creating a new false statements charge that could then be prosecuted. But while recognizing this concern, Justice Ginsburg also agreed with the majority that any solution lay with Congress, which could amend the statute if they thought it was too broad. In the wake of the Brogan case, Congress has not acted to amend the false statements statute, but there is a voluntary internal Department of Justice policy related to such cases. The Justice Manual provides that prosecutors generally should not charge false statements, quote, in situations in which a suspect, during an investigation, merely denies guilt in response to questioning by the government. This policy is not absolute, but it does provide internal guidance to prosecutors concerning the types of cases they should bring. Now, there are many ways for an individual to lie to the government. Many such lies never end up being prosecuted or even detected. But in appropriate cases, the breadth of the federal false statement statute gives federal prosecutors a potent weapon with which to respond. We all learn from an early age that lying is wrong. But when it comes to lying to the federal government, it's not merely wrong. It could also land you in prison.